Welcome to the Hope Sports Podcast, where we believe the best way for you to unlock your full potential is by living into your purpose. We believe discovering your purpose is the only way for you to live a meaningful life. I'm your host, Olympic gold medalist, Laura Wilkinson. Each week, I have the privilege of connecting with a different elite athlete to discuss how they win big in and out of their sport. And this week is a super special one because we have the founder of Hope Sports on with us today, Guy East. Guy was a professional cyclist striving to prove that he was worth more than what his classmates thought of him. But after reaching success, he found it empty and he began to feel lost. He sold everything he owned, lived with the homeless, and began to help people and form relationships like he never had before. And you won't believe where his journey ultimately led him. Thanks for joining us. Now let's dive on in. Guy East, a super special warm welcome to the Hope Sports Podcast. Thank you. I am very excited to be here. (laughs) Well, Guy, your story is a unique one, and I would just love it if you could tell us how you got into cycling and where all that journey has taken you. Yes, it's uh, it is it is unique. And uh, when I was a kid, I dreamed of becoming a professional cyclist. And uh, Lance Armstrong, when he was winning his t- first Tour de France in 1999, really became a huge motivator for me. As I saw him in his yellow jersey after having just recovered from cancer, I looked at the TV and I said, I want to be that. I want to win the Tour de France. And um, so I put all my effort and energy to for that goal. And um, I first picked up a bike when I was in sixth grade and I was at this small private school and kids were making fun of me calling me gay and girl and gay south and girl west and all these different names that you get called in 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 middle school it's unfortunate but I, i just wanted to run away and to not be a part of it to not be around them at all and my my parents tried to get me to do school sports to do track and field and i just wanted to to ride my bike and to to get away from these kids and so i would go out on my bike as a 11 or 12 year old and just ride in rage and anger against these kids who were calling me names in school. And I said, I'm going to prove to these kids that I'm somebody. And, um, so I, I went out and I did that and I got better and better. And, and as Lance Armstrong encouraged me, uh, I saw pictures of the U S national team and I, you know, became inspired by them and wanted to race for the U S national team and, and went and did that. But I remember uh, as a sixth grader, waking up, being so inspired and waking up every morning and putting this fake gold medal around my neck, looking into the the mirror, raising my hands high above my head and listening to the Olympic theme music, Summon the Heroes by John Williams. And that was my morning ritual. And wow, so you actually made a medal? Oh, I, I had, you know, a medal that I had won in some competition. Mm-hmm. And I just used that as a, you know, as my gold medal. and. Um, I just envisioned myself on the Olympic podium and nobody was going to stop me from, from that dream. Wow. So, so I went out and I, I really went for it and all of my effort and energy went towards that goal. And, you know, part of my motivation was, was to prove to people that I was worthy and that I was capable and that I was better than the names they were calling me in school. And, um, you know, when I was seven, 16 or 17 years old, I got invited to race with the, the U.S. national team or to participate in a camp in San Diego, California at the Olympic Training Center. And that was kind of my first journey onward. And then in 2009, I got invited to ride for a team that Lance Armstrong created to develop the next generation of, of young talent. And I was one of 10 or 11 kids in the whole world that were selected and it was obviously a huge honor to uh to be selected by by lance and this you know team and so we were kind of taken under his wing and yeah it was just an amazing experience and it was it was a beginning of the realization that i could accomplish my dream of being in the tour de france of winning winning an olympic medal and it was pretty cool I bet it sounds cool. I can't imagine being under that kind of, I mean, he was already a legend in the making, you know, I mean, that would be 
intimidating. Was it ever, I mean, I know you said you were motivated by like the names people were calling you and stuff. Did that ever get exhausting though? Being motivated by a kind of anger and like out to prove yourself? That's a great question. I don't know that I can say that it ever got exhausting. Um, <laughs> that anger drove me for quite some time. And, and after a while, further into my career, I guess it, it did because I was competing out of this desire to prove to people that I was worthy and capable instead of just competing because of the love of the sport. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, cause if I, if I couldn't prove myself through winning, if I couldn't prove myself through accomplishing what I had told everybody I was going to accomplish, then who was I, you know, I was, I, I, I wasn't, uh, wasn't able to prove to them. And so it, in a way it did, but I didn't realize that it was exhausting until several years down the road. <laughs> Okay. So at what point, I mean, did things start to change? You're, you're on Lance Armstrong's team. You're being developed to being like this next great generation cyclist. Like where did things kind of go from there? I really felt like I was on the up and up and was, you know, gonna, gonna do everything I had set my heart on doing. And then we went to Mexico city for a race in 2009 and we were staying in this beautiful five-star hotel at the end of this very long 10 day race and I was totally exhausted and, and, uh, but it was, it was luxury and we were, that's, that's kind of the life we got accustomed to. And so I was staying in this five star hotel and as a cyclist, you're told to, as I think most athletes, you're told to, you know, don't use energy unless you absolutely have to. And so we would just sit in our beds and wait until the races all day long. We wouldn't waste an ounce of energy unless we had to, but I, I kind of had a different perspective and I wanted to go explore and to see because we were, we were traveling the world and we were seeing these incredible places that we might not ever come back to. And so, so I, I went out and I remember it very distinctively. Um, I walked out of the hotel and in front of the hotel, there's, there's people living in, in shacks and sleeping on the concrete sidewalk and on the street and kids playing, you know, in front of the hotel without any shoes and shirts on. And, and it was poverty, you know, these people were living in poverty. And I said, what in the world, how is this possible? I'm staying in this five-star hotel and right in front of the hotel, there's people that are what seem to be suffering and, living in a very different condition than what that I was in. And I said, why am I in Mexico city racing a bike when I feel like I should be here helping these people? And part of me really wanted to, to run away and to never think of this again and to just put in the back of my brain. And part of me wanted to stay and help. And I, it was at that moment that I really began to question what I was doing as a, as an athlete. And I said, you know, after much thought, I was like, basically, we're just traveling around the world. We're, you know, living this life of luxury and I'm winning medals and they're just sitting on my shelf and they're collecting dust, you know, and you've got all these great people that have done great things in the past and in the sport of cycling. And, and, and I said, well, they're forgotten. Nobody cares about them anymore. Everybody's on to the next great hero, the next great cyclist. And I said, you know, what, what am I going to be remembered for in my life? You know, like, am I just going to be remembered that I was a fast cyclist that I could, you know, win and beat other people? Or was I going to be remembered for something more and make a bigger difference in the world? And obviously those thoughts didn't come to my mind. All of those didn't come to my mind right as I was standing there in Mexico city, but it was, it was a process of really dissecting what I was living my life for. And it took some time, but ultimately I realized that I wanted to live for more than just a bicycle, for more than just winning a championship. Even if it was an Olympic medal, I wanted it to, I wanted my life to mean something more than that. And I, I didn't think that you could be a professional athlete and be a purpose-driven person or be a person of faith or, or, or really have any interest in your life outside of sport because for me, it was, it was so cutthroat and it was either you're all in or you're all out. And I had always been, been told by coaches and stuff that, that unless you devote a hundred percent of your time and energy 
into you and your sport, then you're not going to make it. And so that was what I kind of grew up with. And I said, well, I value more the desire to leave a impact to make a difference in the world than I do to be a successful cyclist. that's going to be soon forgotten. So I, you know, sold everything I owned and went and lived a completely polar opposite life uh, from, from what I had come to know. So you were 21 years old when you were standing in front of that, that hotel in Mexico and you started to realize, obviously not right there on the spot, but you, you started to realize that you're riding a bike. There's more going on in this life. You want to be remembered for more than just getting a bunch of medals and being really fast on a bike. And it led to you selling everything that you owned. So like, how long did that kind of, cause that's a big move to sell everything that you own and, and walk a complete walk away from this life to, to a completely different one that you didn't understand or know and what you were walking into. So like, how long did that take to develop and what, I guess, what were there other things along the way that kind of pushed you to that place? Yeah, it took, it took a long time. Um, and because I was afraid, I was afraid that if I wasn't a cyclist, that people would uh, reject me, that my family would reject me, that my friends would reject me because I had come up with this skewed idea that people only loved me because I was a cyclist. Because partially I, I got into this to prove to people that I was somebody, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, it was, I, I was a cyclist one, because I loved it. And two, because I wanted to prove to people that I was somebody important. And so my whole life was about that. I mean, it was, it was me as a cyclist and, and I put all my eggs into one basket. And so to leave that all behind was very challenging. And I had a lot of fear and I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a college degree. I didn't have any plan in my life. I just knew that I didn't want to do this. And so to go from that point in Mexico city to probably, you know, a year later or, or more where I, I ended up quitting. Um, it was a lot of inner turmoil, a lot of thinking. And for, for most of that time, while I was still racing, I absolutely hated it. I hated it. And I just couldn't enjoy it anymore uh, for so many different reasons. Um, one of them, I was just told that I was, you know, only as good as my last performance, you know? And mm -hmm. so I was, I was continually reminded by my coaches and by members of the cycling community that, you know, unless you perform today, then you're not worth anything. And so oh. I, I internalized that, that not only me as a cyclist wasn't worth anything, but me as a human being wasn't worth anything. And so it, it was not an easy time of life. Um, and then to add on top of that, uh, eating disorders that I had developed uh, because of this similar mentality, you know, I would wake up and the coaches would pinch me in my stomach and say, Hey, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're too fat today. You, you ate too much yesterday. You need to train harder. You're going to go out and do six hours or, you know, burn 6,000 calories and come back and eat a salad. I mean, absolutely ridiculous stuff, but that's what, that's what I was being told and I had to overcome all of this uh, and I didn't seek any help and I didn't have anybody really walking me through this and so and people were telling me like well you're 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 giving up the dream you're you're wasting your talent you know like how could you possibly quit and what are you gonna do and I I didn't know but I knew that it wasn't gonna be this any longer and so just to, to you know, it was not easy. It was mo one of the probably most challenging moments or times just because you, everything you've worked for, you realize is now for not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, to take a totally radical different direction in life was, uh, was, was, was obviously not, not easy. You just, you left everything, you sold everything you said, and then you yeah. just... <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah. So, so from, from there, I, I said, well, I don't really know what I'm going to do with my life. And, but I know how to ride a bike. So I'm going to ride my bike around the world and I want to help people because I know I want to help people. Um, uh, and so I said, I'm just going to ride my bike around the world. 
And so I started reading these books of all these people that were riding their bike around the world. And I started looking at bikes to buy. Wow, that, and, that's like a thing? People do that? Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, man, that's totally. Crazy. There's there's all kinds <laughs> of crazy stories out there. But, you know, at that point, looking back now, I was just avoiding. I feel like I was avoiding reality because I didn't know what else to do. And so just escaping from from this world where I appeared group where I felt rejected um, and in society where I didn't feel like I fit in because I didn't have a college degree and I didn't, ha- didn't develop any other skills in life. So, um, so I was like, I'm just going to go ride my bike around the world and I'm going to help people because that's, you know, I'm a Christian and I wanted to, I wanted to help people and I wanted to, to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever I could go. And so, but I said, well, that's a pr- pretty big commitment. <laughs> And it costs a lot of money and it's a lot of time. And I don't really know what I'm doing. I've never done that before. So I, on my 22nd birthday, I think it was my 22nd or 23rd birthday, I did a little exploration visit to Puerto Rico. I bought a one-way ticket to Puerto Rico and I just started hanging out with people on the street, you know, like homeless people and working with different churches and nonprofits and seeing if I could be of help to them. And then I journeyed onward through all of Central America and was just trying to help people wherever I could and really felt connected to people in a way that I hadn't before, connected to uh, my faith in a way that I hadn't felt connected before, connected to the purpose that I hadn't felt connected to before. And I really loved it. It was awesome. Uh, but I should say before I actually went to Puerto Rico, I was living in homeless shelters in Indiana in Bloomington, Indiana, and was eating in soup kitchens and stuff. And so I, I, I got a taste of what it was like before I went overseas to do this. And so I, you, you I, were doing that just to get into that, like to understand what people were going through. Yeah. I said, you know, if I want to help people, if I want to make a difference in, the, in their lives, I want to know what it's like to be them instead of, you know, standing up on a, on a pedestal and, you know, handing them food. And, and I want to be one of them and to feel what it was like to be in their shoes. So, so I did that and quite an eye opening experience. Um, and then all through, through Central America and meeting some fascinating people and hearing some crazy stories. And uh, I met a guy named Jimmy from Haiti and he had lost his entire family in the earthquakes. And he, he, you know, got some money and bought a motorcycle and he started a little taxi business around Dominican Republic and, you know, was taxing people around and, and doing anything he could to stay alive and um, to keep his mind off of the difficult challenges he had lived through in the past, you know, and all kinds of crazy stuff and amazing people. Uh, but it was, I definitely felt more victorious and, and more content doing this than I ever had on my bicycle. Mm. Wow. Wow. So how long were you doing that? How long were you just traveling the world and just living among people, strangers that became friends and just helping? Like, how long did that last? It was a period of of about two years on and off. I would come home and for the holidays and then I'd go out again and just do, you know, different countries and do various things. But it was about two years. And in the, in the midst of that time, we lost our family home to a fire so that was a pretty tragic event and there was a lot going on, but, um, yeah, about two years. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of that, I, I realized that I loved competing. I loved riding my bike, which was just, just really strange revelation. And I said, Hey, you know, I'm going to go ride my bike again and I'm going to try and compete again, but I want to do it totally different than I had in the past. I'm not going to let my results define me. I'm not going to let people tell me that I'm not any good. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm just going to do it strictly because I love it. And so I started riding again, just out of the love of my bicycle, just as, uh, as I was a kid, as a 12 year old, 11 year old rolling down the street with the wind blowing through his hair. I mean, that's, and I said, I want to race professionally again. So, I did it. How, wow, that's awesome. I love it. I I love how this passion for your bike was born out of two years of not being on it and serving other people. Uh, That's just, God works really cool like that sometimes. How, how was that coming back though? Like, I mean, 
I guess you had this newfound passion, but did you kind of have to start at square one and get back into shape all over again and all of that too? It was surprisingly not as difficult as I thought to get back into shape. And, but, you know, I had, I, I realized that it wasn't, that it was absolutely possible to be a, uh, a purpose based athlete or purpose driven athlete and compete at the highest levels. And, and I wanted to, I wanted to sh- show that it was possible. I didn't know that I was going to be racing at the level I, I did. Uh, but I, I just wanted to give it a go because, you know, I really loved riding my bike and it was something that I, this inner passion that I could not avoid any longer. And so just to see that come to life again was pretty cool, but it was much easier to get into shape, much easier to train, much easier to compete and travel because I loved it. Mm. It's a mic drop right there. <laughs> how, how did you marry this time? You have the love back that you maybe never even had before, but like, how did you marry that with this purpose driven life? that you didn't have before? Like, how did that show up? And it wasn't just about the medals. Like, how did you kind of marry those things together? I, I just had more in my life going on. And I had a bigger, bigger perspective on life and a bigger perspective on what was important. And, you know, whether I won or lost wasn't necessarily important. It was whether or not I had left it all out there and was competing to the best of my ability. And I think that beforehand I was, I was just, everything was performance and everything was living up to people's expectations and making my sponsors happy and making my coaches happy. And I was just competing out of fear. I was competing out of fear of losing what I had, fear of not being, not being a professional cyclist any longer, fear of, of losing a contract or not being hired next year. And it was, it was all riding on performance and so and and no passion. And so then to come back and be like, you know, whether or not this works out, it doesn't matter. I'm just out here and I'm having fun and I love it because I love it and I'm doing it because I love it. And there's so much more freedom in that. And it didn't it didn't dictate my daily routine necessarily. I mean I definitely worked my butt off and I was training three or four hours a day and but I had stronger relationships, relationships that were outside of sport. And I had other things going on. Like I was, I was serving the poor and I was, you know, doing a bunch of other stuff. And my life was not revolving 100% around cycling, which was a huge revelation to me. That's so cool. Well, how did all of this lead to you founding Hope Sports? And tell us what Hope Sports is and what it does. I started Hope Sports because I realized that after this journey that I was not the only athlete that was in the the boat that I was in. I realized that a lot of my peers didn't like what they were doing, that they were, you know, struggling in life. They were identifying only as, as athletes. They had no purpose. And I realized that through serving the poor, it amplified my perspective on what was important and helped me gain a healthy perspective on sport and competition and on life in general. And so then to bring other athletes into the fold was, and to change the culture of sport. I said, you know, we could change the culture of sport. We don't have to just be, be athletes out there, you know, banging our head against the wall, like donkeys, you know, just like not even knowing what we're doing or why we're doing it. I want, I want, I wanted athletes to compete with purpose to enjoy what they were doing, to compete with passion and to, to really live a full life. And so we were, we brought, we started bringing athletes in to do these home builds in Mexico with homes of hope in 2012 and seeing the lights that were going on in these athletes heads, you know, saying, Hey, you know, this is pretty cool. Like I'm, I am, I am more than an athlete. I am more than the sum of my results. I can make a difference in the world. And, um, I want to be somebody that's more than an athlete. It was, it was, it was out of that, that, that hope sports was birthed and realizing that very few people were making 
a concrete difference in the lives of athletes as individuals. There's a lot of coaches out there that, you know, that you teach the physical training, but there's very, very few people out there who are teaching the emotional and spiritual and mental health development, whatever you want to call it. And I saw a huge opportunity to be able to impact the lives of athletes and to change society, to change youth um, in a very positive way, in a very unique way. It's quite strange to bring people to Mexico to build homes for the poor, but that's how it started. And, and it's, I think it's just incredibly effective. And we've heard from so many different athletes, how big of an impact it's had on their lives. It's just get out of their comfort zone and to do something for somebody else, to build relationships with people outside of their bubble. It just changed everything for them. Yeah, I, it's so, so awesome. Like just to talk from my personal experience with Hope Sports, like you you just messaged me on LinkedIn randomly one day and <laughs> like, hey, you want to come build a house in Mexico? It's like, who is this, you know? And uh, it was kind of funny because it, it just sounded awesome. Like you just told me a little bit about it. It sounded great. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go build a house in Mexico. Like I don't know how to build anything, <laughs> but I'm going to go do this. And it was so cool because I came with a bunch of other people that you apparently tracked down on LinkedIn and we, we all showed up up on the same weekend to build this house. And it was really cool because I think most of us were Olympians. There were some pro athletes too, but um, we were all different sports from all all over the place. I mean, Canada, US, um, Jamaica, you know, everything. And it was so neat to everybody kind of just came together to do this thing for this family that we'd never met before, you know, that we're not living in a house. It was kind of a shack that was leaking and had dirt floor and they were all sleeping in one bed. And I mean, it was just, you know, it was seeing that I think from the athletes, it's, it's so interesting because you go and you, you give this family this gift that, that literally changes their whole life. You know, it changes their health, it changes their income, it changes everything for them. And, but I think almost one of the coolest takeaways is, is this bond that you share as athletes realizing that there is something more than just your sport and beyond like what you're saying, what you do. I mean, as, as impacted as the family is, it seems like the athletes are almost impacted more, you know, as they walk away. And as we kind of like all, you know, talked about it afterwards and kind of, I mean, it's just, it, it's amazing. Like the whole weekend is amazing. And you build a house in two days and you don't have to know how to do anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it was just so cool. I'm sitting there putting on a roof. I've never done that before, but it was just, I don't know. It just empowers you in so many ways. And it, and it makes you realize that, that there is so much beyond just what you're doing on the playing field or in the pool or wherever your sport takes place. It's, it's really an amazing weekend. Yeah, it is. And I remember a lot of people crying that weekend. Oh, yeah, I was one of them. <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> just handing over the keys. And it's, you know, uh, there's this quote from an Olympic silver medalist who came down who really sums it up great. He said, I hate to paint, saw, and nail. But then I thought, it's for a good purpose. But then I thought about how much I hate to paint, saw, and nail. But then I thought, it's for a good purpose. I'll go. But when I saw the family living in these circumstances, I discovered how much I loved to paint, saw, and nail. And we realized that the gift of being able to give to this family has made us feel alive in ways that our sport has so often robbed us. I really love that quote. And it's really true. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, I'm no builder, believe it or not. And, um, but sport, you know, strangely enough has robbed a lot of people of joy and it certainly robbed me of joy. And I think it has the potential to do so many good things for society and for individuals. Um, but we've kind of lost our way on that. Some of us have, and you know, a perfect example is I often tell this is when I was in, when I was a professional athlete, my coaches would tell me, you know, if I was sick or had a broken toe or a broken collarbone or whatever, they would say, get out there, suck it up. How bad do you want this? Go out there and train. You know, you're going to lose your spot if you don't man up. And so I would go out there and I would train hard and I'd learn to persevere. I learned to push through the pain. And I became a great athlete. And then I brought that same characteristic to my marriage. <laughs> and my wife is six months pregnant, throwing up over the toilet. And I say, suck it up. Push the pain. <laughs> Get over it. 
It doesn't work. <laughs> it, it absolutely does not work. He's happily married, <laughs> but I'm a recovering athlete. <laughs> well said. <laughs> what, what I learned is that sport develops what we call performance characteristics, the ability to work hard, the ability to persevere, to push through the pain, but it doesn't develop characteristics that we call moral characteristics, love, compassion, generosity, graciousness. And that's what we really value in human beings, like the ability to relate well with one another. And so I, I feel like it's so important for us as, as leaders in, in this world of sport to, to emphasize the importance of developing those characteristics in young athletes. And yeah, you want to work hard. We want to help you work hard and sport absolutely helps that. But if it's not balanced with the moral characteristics of you also being a quote unquote good person, then, you know, you're just like me yelling at your wife to suck it up as she's throwing up over the toilet, you know, with, <laughs> and she's pregnant, you know, I mean, it doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> it's not, it's not good. Um, so, yeah, we just, I feel like we have to be so intentional. And I feel like there's so much opportunity to shape the future generations of, of young athletes through this renewed perspective um, so that they can go into life and be healthy and whole people, whether they compete at the highest level or whether they don't, but they, they understand that, um, that they are who they are and they're loved for who they are and, 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 as a society, we don't put so much pressure on them to be the best. So we see the huge potential for athletes to, to for sport to be used for good. And, uh, and there's just something so special about, you know, doing stuff for other people that really changes our perspective. And I feel like there's no better way that, to, to learn that than a help sports trip. And so that's, that's why help sports was created. And, you know, the, the, the home builds that we do are one thing and telling athlete stories in the podcast is another. And we're getting into training coaches on how to develop their athletes character and, you know, and, and moral characteristics and, and be loving and teach them how to be compassionate towards one another. And how can we really use sport for good instead of harm? Uh, because if you're a kid or if you're like me and you feel like you're only loved when you perform, you feel like you only loved when you win. Uh, you, you, you begin to think that you have to earn people's love, and whether that's your father or whether that's a coach or, or whoever that is. And I think that's just a shame. And I, I, I feel like uh, that damages a lot of people in the long run. Dr. Ben Holberg, he was the second episode that we had of the Hope Sports podcast. And I love how he talked about purpose-based identity. I mean, so much of what you've been talking about, like that you you can't earn love through your performances and you can't, you know, if you're doing it for all the wrong reasons and you just realize that you're just gathering a bunch of medals to just sit on a dusty shelf somewhere, there's no purpose in it, you know, and you're, you went out and sought purpose beyond your sport and came back to your sport with a purpose, you know, which is really, really cool. And I love how Ben kind of hammers home that when you have that purpose-based identity versus the performance-based identity, that purpose-based identity allows you also to go above and beyond what maybe you were initially capable of too, because there's, there's now more meaning to it. There's more behind it and it gives you that extra drive and motivation to go forward. And it's such a beautiful thing. And I think when you don't know how to find that purpose, kind of doing what you did, like going and seeking it out on something like the home build is such a great place to start because you will find purpose there. You will see that there is way Way more to life than your sport and that love is not earned that it is something that should be freely given and should be unconditionally given um, that performance is something completely separate and so to learn what purpose is and to to learn to have a purpose beyond yourself I think is so so powerful yeah absolutely and I and I feel that if our purpose is is winning as athletes if our purpose is winning then we're never going to be satisfied because we, 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 we think, you know, if I get the scholarship or if I win this championship, then I'll be happy. Then I'll have everything I ever wanted. And you get there and you realize that it doesn't bring you the happiness or the joy that you anticipated. And you, you, you realize that winning just means you have to keep on winning to keep it up. You know, you win the championship one year. 
And now you got to defend the title the next year. But if, if you, if we can learn to, to be high performing individuals, to perform to the best of our ability and to be content with where we're at now, to just be happy and to enjoy the process, then we're happy now and you'll be happy and grateful when you win the championship, but you're not any less of a human being if you don't. And if you do great, it's a great accomplishment, but that should not define you. And if it does, you know, it's, it's a difficult life. Um, and it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so we want to, we, we want to free people of that mentality and just help them understand that they are uh, just great for who they are. So there's this, there's this coach, his name is Anson Doris, and he's, he's, like, he's think, I think he's won 21 NCAA national championships. And he obviously is very successful. And he said the key to his success is that every year he's taking characteristics on his athletes. He's taking notes on what makes them special, what makes them tick, characteristics on who they are. And at the end of the season, before the championship game, he writes a letter to the seniors playing on the team and he reads the letter that he writes the seniors to each one in front of the entire team. And he, he says, this is who we're playing for. This is what we're playing for. And they go out there and they play with heart and they, they play for one another. And he says, when we win, I, I believe in, I don't believe in trophies. He said, I give my players roses because the taste of victory lasts for a short while and then it fades away and dies. And I think that is such a beautiful picture of what winning in sport is like. And it's, it's, it's something that we, we should work hard for and to go and absolutely try to the best of our abilities, but understand that the taste of victory is sweet for a short while and then fades away and dies. And I just think there's no better imagery than that. And if we can go and I, yeah. How, how should I end that? I just feel like there's no better imagery than that. And really, yeah. yeah. I, that's perfect. Just there's no better imagery than that. I think you could just end with that. It's pretty, I mean, I love that. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Give your players roses. That's really cool. Yeah. I, um, like, to, I like to show people my... <clears throat> I, when I go speak to groups, um, I like to take my, my Olympic gold medal with me and I, I show them from the stage and I say, it's, it's beautiful. You know, you can see it from up here. It's this amazing thing. And people are like ooing and aahing. But then I pass it around. And I tell them when you look up close though, you'll see I've dropped it a few times. The, the gold on the outside, cause it's only plated in gold. It's starting to rub off cause so many people have touched it. The embroidery is unraveling. Like it's, it's this beautiful, awesome thing that we strive our whole lives for, but it's tarnishing and it's fading and it's not going to last. You know, it's, it's a reminder that it is that fleeting moment. And so I, I love the idea of, of just, it's like a rose. It's, it's the sweet smell and taste of victory and then it's gone. Yeah. So what are you really doing it for? Yeah. I mean, you do it for, you do it because you love it, you know? And I think it comes back to that. You, you, you compete because you love it and you don't let it define you. And what, what, what we tell our athletes on, on the trips is, what what the what John Ashley Knoll tells our the athletes is to start a gratitude journal and to write down five things that you're thankful for every single day and you know you become a grateful person no matter if you win or whether you lose you you look to look you you learn to look to the bright side of things and um when you lo- win an olympic medal it's it's a happy moment in your life but you're, you're grateful for all the relationships and the whole process along the way. And that one moment is, is, is not going to define who you are. It's, it's something you're very proud of, but um, you as a human being are so much more than that. And so I just think it's so great. I totally agree. Now, how can people, if they want to sign up for um, one of the home builds, how would they go about doing that? They can go online to hopesports.org and sign up and experience Hope Sports in its finest. Uh, we've got a trip coming up June 7th through 10th. We've got a trip, a couple trips in the fall. They can go online and find that information there. It's super easy. Yep. Just go sign up online. It's a great website, really easy to navigate. And you can just contact if you have any questions at all.
Guy, thank you so much for being on, telling us just about your heart, about all your your crazy adventures that have led to such a purpose-driven life and um, just an awesome organization in Hope Sports. And we love that now the Hope Sports podcast is an extension of that, sharing that hope and that purpose with other people. Thank you. I love being on. Thank you for all the work you do, Laura. You're awesome. I don't know about you, but I can totally relate to Guy's story. As an athlete, it is so easy to get caught up in our results and good or bad, we let them define us as a person. That's one of the main reasons that Guy created Hope Sports and the Hope Sports podcast to show not just athletes, but anyone who feels trapped and defined by their results or their performance, that there's so much more purpose in your life, that your worth and value as a person is not contained in a time, a score or a weight that you matter and you are loved whether you're at the top of the podium or at the bottom of the heap. And if you're somebody who's struggling to find that kind of purpose in your life, continue listening to this podcast. Listen to the stories of all of these athletes and how they had to struggle to find that there was purpose beyond their performance. Or sign up for a home build with Hope Sports. Do something that you've never done before by building a house and changing a family's entire life. And in return, that experience, it will change yours. Make sure to join us next week when we have four-time Olympic skeleton racer Katie Ulander on the show. On behalf of Hope Sports, I'm Laura Wilkinson. Thanks again for tuning in and have a great week. This podcast is produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media. For more information on Hope Sports and to access the complete archives, please visit hopesports.org. Hope Sports.